if you would grab your Bibles or a device in which you're able to get to the Bible, we're going to be in Romans chapter 16 this morning, as Pastor John mentioned, and we're going to be picking up at verse 17, right where we left off last Sunday, and as was mentioned, this is our very last sermon in the book of Romans. So give yourself a round of applause. You made it, right? Like, yeah, okay. Um, maybe second service will be a little more enthusiastic about that. But as you're turning there, just wanted to make mention of this. Um, we are excited and honored to be able to make available for free these little magazines called Calvary Chapel Magazine. Um, it comes out quarterly and with, with the COVID dynamic that we've been experiencing, it was a little bit delayed last quarter, but a fresh batch of magazines have come in and it's a little bit of insight into what happens with the Association of Churches known, of, known as Calvary Chapel around the country and the world. So I'd encourage you to grab one for one or two reasons. Number one, for yourself. If you'd like to find out more about who you're connected to globally, but also not for yourself. You say, what do you mean by that? On the back of this little magazine, they do a great job of simply sharing the gospel. If someone were in, remember those days when you'd sit in a waiting room, like at a doctor's office or something? That's not right now. But when that ever happens again, and you're picking up a magazine and you're just looking through it, sometimes you look at the front and you look at the back. Well, on the back, there's a clear pathway to Jesus, a simple explanation of the gospel. And then our little contact information. If someone in the area says, man, I need to know Jesus and I want to talk to people that know Jesus, this right here is a great gospel track for you. Now, unfortunately, with the COVID culture, you can't leave it at doctor's offices and things. But when I lived in Destin, I used to tell people, like, be a secret saint. Like, go into offices that you don't even have an appointment and, like, leave something there that can help people know Jesus, you know. So maybe if that's still applicable in the COVID culture, if you can find a spot, great. But if not, at the very least, want to make it available to you. There's some available in the foyer and then also in the coffee house. So that is my propaganda piece for this morning. Um, if you would, grab your Bibles, Romans chapter 16. Father, I do pray and ask, as we get into your word, Lord, that you would be the center of our time and attention. Lord, I thank you so much that you radically saved a man named Saul, Saul of Tarsus. And you so radically changed his life that, Lord, you even used him to write most of the New Testament and we're benefiting from his conversion experience today. So may we never think that someone's too far gone to be saved. The one who you used the most in the New Testament to share your heart was the one who seemed to be at odds with you most intensely at one time in his life. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. And Lord, thank you even for your, your sneakiness in that way, your unpredictability, how you have the ability to change a life that no one else can. Thank you for your grace, Lord. Thank you that you save sinners. Thank you that you're good and you're faithful. And I pray this morning as we get into your word, that you would be the center of our time and attention. And I pray that in Jesus' name. And everyone that's still awake said? Amen. Okay, good. Our message title this morning is very simple. We'll put it up on the screen. What's your centerpiece? What's your centerpiece? Now, this is rhetorical. This is more of a monologue, not a, not a dialogue here, but... Do you know what a centerpiece is? If, if you had to define it, would you be able to? I would not without Google or good old Webster. So I looked it up and this is the definition of centerpiece. Webster says it's an object occupying a central position. One that is of central importance or interest in a larger whole. It's the big deal. It's the focal point. It's the thing that you see when you walk into a room. It's the the centerpiece. Now, when you think of the word centerpiece, it may be decorative, right? Like maybe something like this, like we're in the fall dynamic, like my wife, I feel like that stuff is everywhere in our home much sooner than it should be. I mean, thank God it was a little bit cooler today, but the pumpkins started rolling out weeks ago, you know. But a centerpiece, it's what's of central importance and what occupies central position. So let me have your attention. Let me see your eyes. What's your centerpiece? What's at the center? When someone mentions that name, 
John Spencer, Joe Marrier, David Yeager, David Clark. I'm not going to go through everybody, don't worry. But what do you think of? What's the centerpiece? You show your centerpiece every second of your existence through your attitude, actions, and choices. You're not as sneaky as you think you are. Your attitude exudes what you're about. Your choices, what you lean into with your resources and what you don't, reveals who you are. What's your centerpiece? And here's what's fascinating to me about Paul. As he closes out this book of Romans... He has a very limited amount of time and resource. And everyone said amen to that. But here's what he does. He has a piece of parchment. And he's actually dictating this letter to someone who's writing it down. And he realizes that he has about this much space on his piece of paper in our context. And you know what he does? With limited resource. It's not a social media post or an email or a blog in which he could just write and write for days, kind of like some preachers do, maybe. But Paul doesn't focus his limited time and space on unpacking theological truths, but there's a place for that, but here's what he does. He focuses in on people, on relationships that God has brought into his life. You know, I recently read somewhere is this little quote that if you're a friend, you're a rich person. Something that was that the Apostle Paul, man, Paul's that guy, his deep knowledge of the scripture, and to see the mission of God accomplished at all costs. That's who Paul is. But he's not just a project oriented person, people. We're at the centerpiece of his life and his ministry. You see, Romans is known as one of the most profound, prolific, and doctrinally rich pieces of all of New Testament literature. And as Paul is closing out that letter, what does he do? He says, let's get into the hypostatic union. No, he doesn't do that. Let's break down pre, post, or mid-tribulation. He doesn't do that. You know what he does? He says, in Romans 16, there's 29 names, some of which he just partnered in ministry with and some that he had other things to say about. But Paul valued people. Paul was rich in relationships. Paul had friends. And last week, Pastor John masterfully shared that in the first 16 verses, he shares like, all about all these like amazing positive experiences he had with some people that they would have been very familiar with. You know what I find interesting of those names? Nine of them are female. You say, why do you find that interesting? In that culture, in that time, in that dynamic, you did not look to that gender for leadership or for service. But you know what Paul does? Nine of the names that are mentioned belong to a girl. You see, in ministry, it's all about collaboration and service. But in ministry, it's also following the order that God lays in Scripture. And what is that order? It's called complementarian theology. You say, what do you mean by that? I thought we weren't talking theology. I thought this was church on a Sunday morning. I thought we were just hanging out. Like, complementarian theology, read the book of Ephesians. Read the book of Genesis. Read Titus and Timothy where he says very clearly, elders in the church are called to be of the male gender. Say, what? Can you say that in the 21st century? Absolutely. Paul did something so radical in the first century, he included women in ministry. And they've always been included. But that doesn't mean we kick against the order that God has laid through creation and through scripture. It's not just a view Like, oh, that's just your opinion. That's what the Bible teaches. Male and female working together collaboratively in unity and under the order that God sends. And someone once told me this, and it's so true. Neil, if you have a problem with authority, which I've often had, you ultimately have a problem with God. 
Because he's the one that sets authority. He's the one who puts that person in place. He's the one who structured it the way that it is. The church is most vibrant and powerful when it just simply does what God tells it to do. And and what he does here that I so love about what, what Paul is saying is, listen, God uses all of us, male, female, Greek, Jew. And you know what happens in verse 17 after he starts talking about all these positive relationships he has? Well, starting in verse 17, he starts talking about what I would call like those, like those special saints, those difficult disciples. <laughs> Maybe, do you have these kind of people in your life? Those people that when you see that name on that phone call or text thread or email or you see that face and you go, go okay, this is a time to endure, right? Like I'm going to put that smile on my face and I'll just be honest with you. Sometimes in life there's people that you don't always enjoy, but you kind of endure, Is anyone else honest in church? Maybe you have one person like that. Everyone's got super quiet. They're like, oh no. But there's just these people, right? That there's this dynamic where it's just challenging. And you may say, can you say that as a Christian? Like, aren't you supposed to love everybody? Like, aren't you supposed to be like this guy? Like, this is what the Christians look like. We're always like Mr. Rogers, right? We're always welcoming. We call everyone friend. Isn't that what we're supposed to be? Well, let's see. Look at verse 17 of Romans chapter 16. Reading from the New Living Translation. Paul writes this, and now I make one more, watch out for people who cause division and upset people's faith by teaching things contrary to what you've been taught. Stay away from them. Such people are not serving Christ our Lord, they're serving their own personal interests by smooth talk. And glowing words, they deceive innocent people. But everyone knows that you're obedient to the Lord. This makes me very happy. I want you to be wise in doing right and stay innocent in any of wrong. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. May the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. I'm on, I, I want to be honest with you. I'm not perfect nor do I profess to have a perfect view on everything in life. But I do feel that on the authority of God's word, I can say this. Some people are just bad news. Bad. Not like this guy, like not the 80s, the 90s, you know, that kind of thing. But there's some people who, maybe even professing believers... Well, they, um, let me put it to you this way. Let me read from Warren Wiersbe. I thought what he said was insightful and he's smarter than me, so let me just read him. This warning sounds foreign in a chapter filled with greetings. Usually, but Paul knew the dangers in the churches and wanted to warn the saints. Certainly, we as individual Christians are to love and forgive one another, but sins against the church body must be dealt with according to scriptural discipline. Christians who cause trouble because of their selfish desires, usually pride, they want everyone else, they want to tell everybody else what to do, are not to be received into the local fellowship. Mark them, avoid them. The word mark means watch them, keep your eyes on them. It is right for the church to keep an eye on, this isn't me, church tramps who run from one church to another, causing trouble and division. These people are smooth talkers and know how to fool the simple. But the discerning saint will see through their disguises. Conquer Satan. Don't let him conquer you. Um, Maybe you remember me sharing with you a couple weeks ago some of my experiences in church planting and church dynamics, just locally over the are Fort Walton Beach, Santa Rosa Beach, and and Panama City, to name a couple of them. And I'd say through the last decade of my life, I've learned some things. I've learned that there's some amazing people, amazing people in the marketplace, locally in our military, that through what they do in their occupation and through the way that they lead their families and through the way they engage in church, And like, 
almost a little bit convicting in how much they really do love God and how much they really do intentionally connect with people and how much they pastor and these guys. I've met some amazing people. And then I've met some uh, not so in the marketplace, in the military that think they're serving Jesus, but ultimately the fruit smells a little bit of division, smells a little bit of pride, a little bit of gossip, a little bit of speculation, a little bit of troublemaking, a little bit of this, (laughs) sin sniffing. You ever met one of those? That they feel like it's their job in the church to go, man, I smell pride over there. I, I smell envy over there. That's what John Corson called him. I thought that little alliteration was so helpful, but there are those that kind of see it as their job in the church to, to sin sniff. Instead of looking up and looking out to those who need Jesus, they start to look in and go, well, that person's, and this, and that, and, and you, and you. And this is what the Apostle Paul says to do, verse 19. He says, listen, everyone knows that you're obedient to the Lord. This makes me happy. I want you to be wise in doing right and stay innocent of what is wrong. And recognize that the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. May the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Here's the biggest danger when you're dealing with a difficult person. You need to know who your enemy is. Your enemy is not flesh and blood. But there is a spirit of division. Read Ephesians. There are those dynamics in the spiritual realm where the enemy will use the lust of the eyes pride of life to distract to divide and what does Paul say to do he says man mark that avoid that stay away from that now take this in context and in concert with scripture we're to be those that dispense grace and mercy we're to do Matthew 18 right like and if there's a dynamic, like meet one-on-one, if that can't, maybe meet in a small group, if that can't work in the church leadership. But I'll be honest, and this is just my little silly world and experience. Sometimes it does come to a point where you have to go, later, bro. And that's okay. But one of the hardest deaths to experience is the death of a relationship where the person is still living. Or what was is no longer and will never be. And yet the relationship physically is alive. But relationally and emotionally and it's not. And that's a challenge. And anyone breathing experiences that eventually. But I think what Paul says here is so, so powerfully helpful let God take care of that. Like he says it kind of in this way. Let, 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 let the God of peace. I love that description there. When he's explaining what's happening. May his grace be upon you. See I once heard this phrase. And I think it's really appropriate here. Like in life. And especially in relationships. Do your best. And then commit the rest to Jesus. Like if you haven't done, and let me just have your attention, let me see your eyes. In my opinion, if you haven't done everything that's within reason and within scripture to pursue someone that you're at odds with relationally, and it's not abusive, it's not sinfully, it's not, that kind, it's not like that kind of relationship you're supposed to pursue, but you know that there's like this thing between you and that person, my opinion, the NIV, Neil's interesting version, I think you're called to pursue one another. Romans talks about that. Chapter 12, verse 18 and 19. As much as depends upon you, be at peace. But you know this, that relationships are participatory, right? They're they're A and B equals C. But at the end of the day, we recognize that God's in control. That God's not mocked. What people sow, they reap. And we let time and fruit speak for themselves. Because God sees. God knows. You can relax. You don't have to take vengeance. Trust Jesus. Don't get jaded. Don't let a few bad experiences relationally ruin you for new experiences with people. Like don't have the bad boyfriend syndrome. You know what that is? Like 
well, this guy treated me bad, so every other guy is going to treat me bad. People do that with relationships and churches and businesses all the time. I'm not speaking against wisdom, but I am speaking to this. Some of us in this room and maybe watching online, we're so deeply wounded because of what he did or what she said that we can't move forward. If we're honest, we don't have friends. Because we're so wounded by what happened when we did, we're too afraid to step into any new relationships. I think you need to be free from that. But it's going to require you to obey the Bible. It's going to require you to trust Jesus. It's going to require you to forgive. And that's a hard thing to do. It's so hard for those 18 inches in Scripture, right? The head to the heart to the hands. But you know what to do. But to see it actualized, those 18 inches make all the difference in the world. And I want to encourage some of you this morning to forgive, to pursue, to let there be grace upon grace. And then the other side of that coin is there's some people where they're so divisive, you have to say, I've got to put this to rest. That's a hard thing to do. Remember Old Yeller, the movie, like where the guy has to like kill the dog? Like, maybe that's a bad illustration. I was just kind of trying to think like, sometimes when someone's near and dear to you, not that you kill the people, but it's like, you know, I, I just got to maybe, all right, let's move on. Paul says in verse 21, though, that there's some good people. Let's get through that. Okay, verse 21, New Living Translation. Paul says, look, man, there's some killer people out there. He says, look, Timothy, my fellow worker, he sends you greetings, as does Lucius and Jason and S and my fellow Jews and... I and T, and one of the ones writing you this letter, send my greetings to you as one of the Lord's followers. Gaius says hello. He's my host. He also serves as a host to the whole church. There's this guy, Erastus, the city treasurer. He sends you greetings. And so does our brother Cortus. Like, man, what are these names? Like, I thought I had it bad. Lily, Lucy, Leda, Liam, Leo. Look at these names that people were hanging with Paul. But Paul recognizes this. Yeah, there's challenging relationships. Let me have your attention. Get over it. Like, that's life. If you expect every relationship to just be happy, clappy, and getting along in the Garden of Eden, you didn't read Genesis chapter 3. Like, there's sin. There's problems. We are not yet in heaven. And I remember something John Corson always used to say. He'd say, Neil, it ain't heaven till it's heaven. Like, don't expect heaven to come down to earth. That's not going to happen. We live in a world riddled by sin. But... There's good relationships out there. See, here's the deal. You want to talk about some frustrating relationships. Look at what Paul endured. But he doesn't become the bitter, non-trusting, salty old pastor. Right? That could have been Paul. Like, don't, don't be that guy. But here's some of the great guys out there. He says, listen, these are some of my travel buddies. Tim. This is the guy that he called the son in his faith. Lucius. He was connected with Paul back in Acts 13 in the days of Antioch. Jason from Thessalonica, Acts 17. This guy, Sosipater, I'm not sure. He was a Berean. But Bereans, if you ever read anything about them, man, Acts chapter 20, those are, that's a good crew right there. Tertius, he was the secretary to whom Paul dictated the letter of Romans to Gaius in, in 1 Corinthians 1. Paul baptized him there at Corinth. If you know anything about New Testament, Paul is writing the letter to the Romans from Corinth, so most likely he's hanging at Gaius's beach condo, if you want to put it that way, as he's writing this. Cordus, we don't know anything about Cordus. And you know what? We don't need to. This guy made the Bible. Did you do that? No, like he made a Bible. Like, here's what, here's what I want to say. Not everyone can write two-thirds of the New Testament. Not everyone's an apostle Paul. But everybody's somebody. And everybody's been gifted. And everyone and I, I believe as a Christian is called to make disciples. And everyone has infinite dignity, value, and worth because they're created in the image of God. Everybody has a part to play. You can't say, well, because I don't have that gifting, because I don't have that good of hair, because I don't have that shirt, because I don't have this talent, because I don't have that background... I get to ride the church pine pony. No, you don't. Like, you're part of the body. You're called to participate. You're called to partner. And if you're not doing that, no wonder your life is so lame. 
Like, no wonder this is boring to you. No wonder you don't give. No wonder you don't serve. Why? Because your centerpiece is not Christ and his church. It's something else. But God has a role for each of us to play. Paul, serving Jesus and serving people, serving Jesus with people. And now Paul shares this doxological truth. Say, what in the world is that? Like, check it out from a couple weeks ago on the podcast. But verse 25, he says, Now all glory to God, who's able to make you strong, just as my good news says. This message about Jesus Christ has revealed his plan for you Gentiles, a plan kept from the beginning of time. But now as the prophets foretold and as the eternal God has commanded, this message is made known to all the Gentiles everywhere so that they too might believe and obey him. All glory to the only wise God through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. I love this. Paul wraps up this letter with his focus on God and what he's done through his son Jesus to reveal something that for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years for God's people was a secret. A secret? The church. That what God was always building was this multi-ethnic group of people who would love one another, live in unity together, centered around Jesus. Can me ask you a question? Isn't that what all the world is screaming for right now? Amen. Have you watched any of the NBA games? You see all that stuff on the back of their back? Like everyone is screaming for, we want unity. We want commonality. We want identity. Perfect platform for what's supposed to come in the book of Revelation. Because the dawn is coming, dear sweet church. But the night must get darker before the dawn arises. And you know that because you know the book of Revelation. You know what's coming. But everything that a human being cries for, why can't we have a good leader? Why can't we connect and recognize that we're made of the same 13 elements that dirt's made out of, all of us, no matter what our skin color is? Why? Because everything is pointing to Jesus. And as humanity puts their stock in a leader, puts their stock in technology, puts their stock in racial whatever, you come to realize all these platforms fail. There's only one who's the great I am. God's so gracious that he allows humanity to kind of kick the tires on everything else throughout the millennia till finally, at the end, say, and there's no other option. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. He says here as he closes out this letter <sighs> that God had a secret to share. It's the church to bring everyone together in Jesus and for those that believe and obey him, those are the ones that are his. See, as we conclude this study, the, the good news for mankind, and I'm kind of asking you this question, what's the centerpiece? Well, we know the centerpiece of the book, right? Maybe we could say it together. It starts with a G, it rhymes with mood, and then start, the second word starts with an N. It's good news. That's the centerpiece. Good news. You know, we do a monthly staff meeting on campus here with everyone that works here. And in our staff meeting, we do these four things. We, we try to have a platform of good communication. Hey, this is what's going on. We try and talk through the calendar. Like, oh, hey, here's what's coming up. We try to have a time of celebration. Oh, whoever's got a birthday that month. And then also just, man, look at what God's done over the last month and, and how we're loving, how we're connecting, how we're living on mission. There's communication, there's calendar, there's celebration, and lastly, there's content. Content. Devotion from the Word of God in what God is teaching us. I'll just be honest with you, those are four C's that you could kind of use in a family meeting, and they go really well too. Your wife will love that. Communication, calendar, content, celebration. I'm trying to give you something free here, husbands, but anyway. Um, for part of the devotion this week, I, I told the staff, hey, pop quiz. Everyone, oh, darn it, what does that mean? 
I've got a $10 gift card for the coffee house. You may think staff members just walk in there and get whatever they want. They, we have to pay for stuff. So I said, hey, $10 gift card. Everyone's like, oh, I'm awake now. I said, here's the question. There are four divisions in the book of Romans, four chapter settings, four sections, four groupings of chapters. If you can name them, you get the $10 gift card. And as I'm even like trying to get the, the point out, Daniel Gunthorpe takes out his little journal and he's thumbing through it like this. He cheated, right? He looked at his notes. You can't do that on a test. No, he didn't cheat. Here's the great thing. He took notes in church. That's good. That's not cheating. You know you could do that right now? You could take notes in church and Jesus isn't going to be mad at you. When the test comes, you can look at the notes. It's encouraged. But let me ask you this question. Daniel got him right. Do you know the four groupings, sections, chapter headings, whatever you want to call it, for the book of Romans? I've got a $100 gift card. No, I don't have a $100 but I kind of expected kind of this like awkward silence and kind of this like, oh no. Like, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to watch a 30 second video to remind us of these four sections. Let's watch this. To write out his fullest Hopefully there's audio, Joe Marrier. The good news if there's not, then this isn't going to help. Life, so what he's saying right now is that yes, there's four sections. Four main movements, but it's unified as one long flowing exploration of the gospel. The gospel, Paul says, first of all, reveals God's righteousness. And then it also creates a new humanity, which fulfills God's promise to Israel. And so it's this gospel that's going to unify the church. Okay, that's it. Super simple. I thought about showing you the 17-minute video, and I thought, that's not a good idea. Four main sections in the book of Romans. Here's the first one. Let's put it up on the screen. The gospel reveals the righteousness of God. That's chapters one through four. If you want to take it down this way, here's what it basically is. This is who God is. So many people go, well, who's God? And da, da. Do you, have you ever read Romans one through four? Like there's a lot in the Bible that tells you about who God is. But in Romans one through four, here's some of the things that it says. That he truly is holy. That he's the creator. That he's the judge. That he's the savior and that he's the promise maker and the promise keeper. If you wanted to pull out some of the characteristics of who God is, well, saturated within the context of the message of Jesus, Paul says, this is who God is. He's the creator. He has the right to judge you. He has the right to tell you right from wrong because he created you. He also is the promise maker and the promise keeper. Romans chapters 1 through 4. And then the second section is in chapters 5 through 8. And this is what it says. It's about the fact that the gospel creates a new humanity. This new people group. And this is what God is doing right now. You live in the age of the church. And what God is doing right now is he... Well, let me read this to you. He says in Romans chapter 4, verse 3, that Abraham believed God and was accounted to him for righteousness. And then in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, he says, everyone has been justified by faith and we have peace through, with God through our Lord Jesus. You say, why are you, what, Israel? Anyone that has faith? God's not done with the nation of Israel. It is a centerpiece of time for what's yet to come. But in sections, chapters 5 through 8, Paul starts to draw this parallel. Listen, in the past, Abraham believed God and it was accounted for him for righteousness. Because of Christ, for those who believe in Jesus, you are now righteous. God's been faithful to the people group of the Old Testament and to the people group of both the Old and the New Testament. And he's unifying and bringing together a whole new people group. Then in chapters 9 through 11, we see what is happening where the gospel fulfill, fulfills God's promise to Israel. What do you mean? Chapter 11, verse 1, Paul says, I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not, for I'm an Israelite. God has not cast away his people. In chapter 11, verse 25, he says, listen, blindness in part has happened 
until the fullness of Gentiles has come. That's another way of saying the church age. And then Israel will be saved. See, in chapters 9, 10, and 11, Paul shows and uses Israel as an illustration of God's faithfulness. He's showing what God is doing now, that there's blindness now, but there will one time be an opening of the eyes of the people of God. And then lastly, Romans chapter 12 through chapter 16, Paul says that the gospel unifies the church. And that's where we've been for the last few months, right? Kind of learning how to live out and lean into the gospel truths through our actions. This is how we live. And as we close this morning, I want to go ahead and invite the, the team up, the band up, and I want, to, I want to share just a few more things before we close down this service and this series. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it, it kicks off, it initiates, it instigates this last season of the book of Romans known as, this is how you live. Let me read to you Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. This is where it starts. It says this. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God. Because of all he's done for you, let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you which is good and pleasing and perfect. What's your centerpiece? What's at the center of your life? In Romans chapter 12, Paul, as I just read, says, listen, in light of the truth of God, who he is, what he's doing, look at what he's done with Israel, wake up, wake up. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Let your mind be transformed by the renewing and the washing of the water of the word. In chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, Paul writes this. I'm not ashamed of the good news of Jesus Christ. It's the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes. The Jew first, also the Gentile. And the good news tells us that this is how we're made right in God's sight. It's accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it's through faith that a righteous person has life. One last scripture, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 13. If you openly declare, let me have your attention, let me see your eyes. We're almost done, don't miss this. If you openly declare that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you're made right with God and it is by openly declaring your faith that you're saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts him will never be disgraced. Jew and Gentile, it's the same. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. You are in everyone. You online, you're in everyone. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So here's where I leave you with this simple question. What is your centerpiece? Centerpiece. Tabitha is going to bring out an example of a centerpiece and set it right here so there can be a little bit of a visual of what a centerpiece is. Can everyone just say thank you to Tabitha? It's very gracious of her. <laughs> Yesterday, my wife put this little centerpiece together. And a centerpiece is meant to do many different things. It's meant to be when you sit down at a dining room table like, oh, look at that. That's all. The fragrance is there. It's pleasing to the eye. It's living. It's fruitful. It's beautiful. That's who Jesus is. Jesus is alive. He's alive. That tomb is empty and the reason you're here on a Sunday morning is so that you would have his life beaming out of you. I don't understand bored Christians. I don't, I don't connect with those that say, yeah, I tried that church thing. Or I, I say, no, you didn't. 
There's no way that you experienced a living, vibrant relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ, and then found something better. It's not possible. It's not possible. You experienced what you thought was Jesus, but really what you got was maybe a little bit of deal of religion. Or you started to entertain sin, and sin gripped your heart. And the enemy, man, he's tricky, he's sneaky, he's deceitful, and over time, like water wearing a rock, he wore your heart down. And your petals are falling apart. You know what you're meant to look like? You're meant to look alive. There's meant to be a fragrance that comes from your life. Why, because you're so awesome? No, but because Jesus is alive and he's inside you. Enthusiasm is the word in theos, to be filled with God. So you're a bummed, boring, lame Christian? That doesn't make sense. It's an oxymoron, it's a contradiction in terms. Maybe you're a Christian who's distracted. Maybe you're a Christian, your centerpiece isn't really Jesus. That's why when people smell you, they go, oh, no, 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 right? Like, but this is the centerpiece that you're meant to have in your life. It's Christ Jesus. Your life is meant to be alive, fruitful and beautiful. And I've gotta say this, and this is an unpopular statement in the 21st century. The only way that's possible is through Jesus. It's not through social equality. It's not through righting every wrong that's ever happened in history. It's not by getting that right lead. It's by having your personal centerpiece be Jesus Christ. And knowing that it's not, he's not just meant for you. Because he saved you, he wants to use you. And it's only then, when you're in right relationship with him and helping everybody else do the same, that you're alive. This morning, Align your mind with the truth. The truth is that God is good and that he loves you. The truth is that his son came to die for you so that you could be alive. Stop living for something less. You're meant for so much more. You're meant to live in a way that you're whole because the Holy One has brought you into a right relationship with Him. Where your soul is at home. You no longer have to look to the next position or relationship or experience or accolade or title or increase in whatever. You're good. You're content. I know it's what your heart cries for. And contentment is only found in Christ. What's your centerpiece? May it be Jesus, because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life.